On this episode, I discuss what is evolutionary biology, an evolutionary biologist's view of a healthier and longer life, and if the paleo diet is best for us as we age. Welcome to Anti-Aging Hacks. On this podcast, I interview top experts in anti-aging and longevity, and we discuss the best natural and medical solutions to bring you practical advice you can apply right now to fight back against aging. We also discuss sneak peeks at some huge scientific advancements coming in the near future that will allow us to age backwards. I am your host, Faraz Khan. Thank you for spending some time with me today. My guest today is Michael Rose, Distinguished Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Irvine. He has a fascinating way of approaching aging, and we get to discuss some of his experiments. I'm glad to have him on the show today. All right, uh, Michael, I'm excited to be talking with you. Welcome to the Anti-Aging Hacks podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. So let's start with a little bit of your background. Where did you go to school, and how did you get interested in the science of aging? So I did two degrees at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. I'm Canadian. And uh, then in 1976, I went to England to do my PhD. And uh, my advisors wanted me to do a PhD on aging. So I did. I was uh, 21 years old at the time. And I, uh, of course, felt that I was personally immortal. That was my emotional feeling, right? Yep wasn't what I factually believe. And uh, therefore, I was not interested in the subject. But uh, they spent a year and a half uh, persuading me from 1975 to 1976. And they finally succeeded. What led you to dive in? Did you have some really good mentors or folks that you worked with? Oh, yeah, I, I had two men who would later become fellows of the Royal Society. Uh, John Maynard Smith, who between uh, 1960 and 2000 was one of the leading biologists in England, uh, regardless of subfield, and Brian Charlesworth, who uh, uh, eventually became a Royal Society professor at Edinburgh. Uh, And he uh, is one of the most brilliant and important biologists of the last uh, 40 years. Wow, that's great company. And I would say that you're up there yourself. So don't (laughs) sell yourself short. Uh, You're a distinguished professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of California, Irvine, which is pretty close to me. So I'm definitely coming to grab lunch or coffee with you soon. Could you describe to your listeners what evolutionary biology is? Well, evolutionary biology is at the other end of biology from molecular biology. Uh, evolutionary biology is concerned with the uh, deep, uh, long-term mechanisms that produce life, underlie life, shape life in all of its aspects. Um, Most of the ideas in evolutionary biology are more general than the biochemistry that is characteristic of our planet. the ideas of evolutionary biology would be just as applicable to a silicon-based life form. It's a carbon-based life form. It's the most mathematical part of biology. It is the um, most controversial part of biology. It has been since it was founded in 1800, not by Charles Darwin, but by Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, a French guy. And uh, it's been my intellectual home for... Um, you know, something like 50 years. Uh, And it's certainly been uh, one of the biggest passions in my life for almost as long. (laughs) Fascinating. So let's cover natural selection quickly for the audience that that may need a refresher. Uh, Natural selection is a process where organisms or animals with favorable traits or genes are more likely to produce offspring, especially in times of duress or stress or hardship. When they reproduce, they pass on these favorable traits to the next generation, who is then better equipped to deal with whatever hardship life is throwing at them. 
I've heard you say that natural selection is very strong before the start of reproduction. And once reproduction starts, the force of natural selection goes down until the end of redu- reproduction and then stays flat. Could you explain that a bit more to the audience? Well, firstly, by way of background, this was a mathematical finding of another great evolutionary biologist, William Hamilton. Um, he did that math in 1966. It's not a verbal concept in his hands. It had been for the preceding 25 years. It was a verbal concept in the hands of J.B.S. Haldane, Peter Medawar, and George C. Williams, um, three more great evolutionary biologists. Uh, but it, Hamilton actually converted into math, and he pretty much showed uh, that um, the force of natural selection acting on survival uh, fell uh, once reproduction starts in a population, um, and it falls all the way down to zero uh, at or shortly before the time at which reproduction stops in a population, and then it remains flat at zero forever after. The core theories that I have worked from are all derived from mathematics. Um, At first, the mathematics of Hamilton and Charlesworth. Charlesworth added explicit uh, genetics to Hamilton's model, which was not explicitly genetic, um, in the 1970s. And halfway through that process, he acquires me as his graduate student. And my job is to take uh, Charlesworth's uh, genetic version of Hamilton's mathematics and do experiments based on on that uh, genetic version of Hamilton's theory. Does that mean, when you say the force of natural selection is very strong, does that mean that when you're younger, before you reproduce, for humans, let's say before high school, 16 years old, that nature is ruthless and weeding out the weak? How would you describe that the force is strong? I think intuitively the best way to think of this is in terms of a gene that kills you uh, with complete certainty and just one copy of the gene is enough. If that gene kills you before the start of reproduction, that gene has eliminated itself from a population. A gene that is just as deadly, but doesn't kill until after every member of the population has finished reproducing, that gene has no effect on its uh, making the next generation. In other words, its lethal effect is not selected against. And in between the start of reproduction and the end of reproduction, uh, the impact of the lethality of that gene steadily falls quantitatively in a way which can be defined, examined, and extended mathematically. I understand. So if a gene or natural selection kills you before you're able to have kids, then the force is very strong. And the longer that it waits to kill you after you've had the chance to reproduce, the weaker its effect is. So you did an experiment where you progressively raised the lifespan of fruit flies. And I think you've been doing it since the 1970s. Would you please explain that experiment and where you're at now? But this is the most elegant experiment. Um, I'm pretty well known for it. Um, This experiment involves very simply the following reasoning. If Hamilton's model is correct and that the force of natural selection doesn't fall until the start of reproduction, and if that fall is the sole sufficient and necessary cause of aging evolutionarily, then all we have to do to slow and even delay the onset of aging is to shift the first stage of reproduction to later ages. Then the math behind the theory says, well then, if you have genetic variation in a population, then over subsequent generations, lifespan should progressively increase due to the evolutionary postponement of aging. Would you have to do that for specific individuals or for everybody in the species? 
everybody in a population. And this would take presumably generations to achieve the longevity that we're talking about here. Right. So one of the reasons why I had to do this experiment on the sly without even telling my advisor is he didn't think it would work. But fortunately, he went away on sabbatical in the United States. We were, I was doing all this, my PhD in England. Um, and I was left by myself for a year. And I, so I said, the hell with this. I'm going to start this experiment on top of all the other experiments I was doing. And uh, within just uh, about a dozen generations, it worked. And you got a statistically detectable increase in average lifespan in the populations I was working with. That is fascinating. So near term, obviously, uh, it, it's great to know this. Near term, it would not help humanity, but that's just a great finding that you found. In your view, what is aging? A aging is the loss of adaptation with age. So adaptation refers to the, your capacity to survive and reproduce successfully. So um, <clears throat> physicians tend to focus almost entirely on your capacity to survive. But if you add in the reproductive part, you then are adding in all your functions, like you know, cognition, uh, uh, ability to produce gametes, in the case of mammals, mammalian females, the ability to take fertilized zygotes and uh, grow them up inside your uterus, um, and then take care of your offspring once they emerge from your body. So once you add reproduction to the survival part, you're really talking about every aspect of the body that works. The only reason your body does anything good <laughs> is because of adaptation built into your uh, genome, or more precisely, the information required for your genome to make your cells and thus your body work properly so that you can survive and reproduce. Right. And is that the primary function of nature is to get us to reproduce and after which we're pretty much useless? Well, that's what the math suggests. And that's what I'm afraid, unfortunately, uh, more than 40 years of experiments suggest. You also say that we can influence the rate of aging through our diet. And you've done specific experiments to prove some of this. What did you learn about the role of diet through your experiments? So firstly, they aren't my experiments, they're the experiments of Grant Rutledge, my former doctoral student who now works for the USDA, which I'm very happy about. And uh, the essential intuition uh, derives again from Hamilton's basic force of natural selection concept. Uh, when you combine it with environmental change, whatever the cause. So because the force of natural selection is very strong in the early part of life, into the early adult ages, if you have an environmental change um, that's sustained, uh, children and young adults will adapt to that environmental change over a number of generations uh, far faster than older adults will. Because older adults, with older adults, the force of natural selection is very weak. So uh, a simple way to understand this is to say, if you're looking at a population that has been in a new environment for dozens to uh, hundreds of generations, then um, the younger individuals will be far better adapted simply to the environmental change than older individuals. And that gets added on top of the normal a pattern of aging that arises simply because natural selection focuses on the young rather than the old, always. So humans are an example of a species that has undergone a major environmental change uh, anywhere from uh, 100 years ago, or two, well, let's say 200 years ago in the case of Aboriginal populations of Australasia, uh, to 10,000-ish generations for the populations of um, Western Asia and Northeastern Asia. Um, that means that in the populations that have long lived under agricultural conditions, like most of the populations of Eurasia, we expect young people to be well adapted to 
an organic agricultural diet. But we expect from the theory that uh, individuals at much later ages suffer from both regular aging and lack of adaptation to this environmental change. Even though we've been doing agriculture for a long time, it's still considered a newer diet. So the newer diets that we have do not serve us well. In fact, if anything, they make us age faster after reproduction or after a certain age. Yes, exactly. And uh, now that's on organic agricultural diets. Uh, the diets of the last uh, century or so, high fructose corn syrup, uh, vegetable seed oils, um, uh, what would be other favorite examples? Um, well, artificial sweeteners, um, all the, you know, when you uh, buy a, a packaged food, heavily processed food, and you read the ingredients, and you start to get into a whole bunch of chemicals, that's food that no one is adapted to. You know, so the, the Red Bull and Twinkie diet that so many American college undergraduates are so fond of, completely toxic for everyone at every age. Now, when you're young, you're just better off at surviving a completely crappy diet. Um, uh, we've done also, uh, especially Grant Rutledge, has done experiments on this effect too. And he has shown that um, at every age, uh, a diet that a population has never adapted to in evolutionary time, so a diet that's been around for like a generation or three, is a diet that's toxic for everybody. Um, that, that's, I think, the scientific basis for the advice that you should only eat things that your grandmother ate. Um, that's no longer strictly correct, but uh, for younger people, because their grandparents might have had a crappy diet too. But right. uh, their great great grandparents certainly, uh, I mean, everybody who was eating food in the 19th century was not eating industrial foods that really started to be invented in the late 19th century and only adopted on a mass basis in the 20th century. Got it. So I believe in the experiments that Mr. Rutledge Rutl Rutl did, there is, he demarcated three different types of diets. One is, one is the really old diet, which would correspond to the Paleolithic diet or that era. Then there's the agricultural period of the last eight to 10,000 years, which was replicated in a different way. And then what you just mentioned is this junk food diet, which is fairly new. It's 50, 30, 40, 50 years old. With all of those, you're saying the junk food diets are just bad across the board because we are not um, accustomed to that in any way, shape or form. But with the other two diets, is, is the beginning of life, so the first 30, 40, 50 years, we're okay eating either way, meaning paleo diets or agricultural grains and beans and legumes. And then at some point, we should shift back to, to the older paleo diets. Yes, that's a, a, a nice summary of the findings. Yes. Okay. And you're, I assume you are obviously following the paleo diet at this point. Yes, I'm, I'm so old that I, I just don't have any real adaptation to agricultural diets. You look super young. I, I don't know if it's the lighting, but you don't have a wrinkle on your forehead. Oh, no, I, I have wrinkles on my forehead. You just, it's just bad lighting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At what age, Michael, did you switch over to the paleo diet? Um, well, it's interesting because I started to show intolerance for agricultural foods that was fairly medically obvious around the age of 20. And that's probably because my ancestors are from the extreme northwest of Eurasia, which is Ireland and Scotland and some English. And those are among the last people of Eurasian ancestry to adopt agricultural diets. So I have all kinds of uh, inadequately adapted uh, uh, features in my genome. People from places like Iran, Iraq, are uh, phenomenally well adapted to wheat-based diets, dairy-based diets. Um, so I started to have these health problems in, in my 20s that were, you know, pretty obvious. 
And I would solve those problems by eliminating uh, components of my diet that caused me grief. And the first thing to go was milk. And uh, then later on, the next thing to go was wheat. And I basically went through a slow stepwise transition from my 20s to my 50s, uh, where I stripped out the agricultural foods. But that was not on the basis of the evolutionary theory. That was just me talking to doctors, talking to people who dealt with food allergies and stomach problems and all kinds of ugly medicine. And uh, one day, uh, this was in uh, 2000, early 2009, a friend of mine had just died of esophageal cancer and uh, like on the Friday. And I was seeing my gastroenterologist on the Monday. And my symptoms had actually been worse than his symptoms, my specifically esophageal symptoms. And uh, so I was terrified that I had esophageal cancer. And the gastroenterologist looked over my, all the records and all the times I'd had an endoscopy, you know, the camera going down your mouth under sedation. And they look around and they found all this weird tissue, which if, if a physician is listening, is listening, I would call metaplastic, not uh, neoplastic, which would mean cancer, but weird looking stuff that interfered with my ability of my esophagus to work. And he said, okay, this is the medicine. Now tell me what you have done, if anything, to improve your symptoms. And I explained that I had eliminated more and more foods. And he said, go farther. It's either that or I put you on corticosteroids. And I said, no, thank you. I've seen what corticosteroids do to people. And that there are some ugly medications, um, especially if taken indefinitely, which is what he was suggesting. But the problem with his advice to go farther is I didn't know what he meant because I'd already eliminated all the foods that gave me immediate distress. And by distress, I mean like emergency room distress. And uh, so I was thinking about this and I went to a uh, seminar given by some plant molecular geneticists, um, which was comparing the genomes of wheat, rice, and corn. And I'd already eliminated uh, wheat from my diet, but I had not eliminated rice and corn. So I said to them, you know, not being a botanist, I said, well, this interesting comparisons, but aren't wheat, rice, and corn very different from each other in terms of their evolutionary genetics? And they said, no, not really. They're all grass species. And they're actually closely related by evolutionary standards. So think like mammals, different species of mammals in animal terms. I said, wow, I did not realize that. And a light bulb went off in my head and I said, oh, so to like really alleviate my symptoms, even though rice and corn don't put me in an ER, let me try eliminating those and see if, if my health improves more. So I did eliminate rice and corn and I found my health was much better. In terms of getting a good bang for your buck, I would assume that, that conference was a good one and that you learned that wheat, corn, and rice are closely related, at least genome-wise to each other, and you were able to eliminate all three. Did you have any other discoveries? And then another symptom I had was favism, uh, which was intolerance to fava beans. Like literally eating fava beans would immediately make me like really sick, like I'd have to lie down. And um, so I thought, well, fava beans are legumes. What if I eliminate all legumes from my diet too? So I eliminated all grass species, all legume species, and I'd already eliminated everything derived from milk. So I go through the next nine months and all through 2009, and um, slowly all of my esophageal symptoms disappear. And I go, fantastic, the gastroenterologist was right. But then what got really weird was that about seven or eight months into this, continuing through yet another year, every other aspect of my health and function started to improve as well. Everything. 
stamina, mental focus, emotion, uh, just get, uh, less sarcopenia. Uh, I lost weight, which I, I didn't do any of this to lose weight. Um, everything got better. Uh, the, the typical middle-aged chronic back pain that most everybody over 50 has, that disappeared. Fascinating. So I'm going to myself in late 2009, early 2010, I'm going to myself, what the hell is going on? How is this happening to me? And then the light bulb turns on. And I think about all the foods that I eliminated. Every single food that I eliminated was agricultural. And every food that I had absolutely no problem with was a paleo or an, a long ancestral uh, dietary component, like fruit, nuts, honey, uh, eggs, anything from an animal carcass, like, you know, of course, meat, but fat, organs, all that stuff worked just fine. And I went, aha, it's only the agricultural foods. And then I thought, wow, Hamilton's math can explain this. And then we did some math, and the math, starting from Hamilton's forces of natural selection, worked. And that was done with uh, Larry Muller, uh, M-U-E-L-L-E-R, same as Robert S. Muller, but different first name. Um, and it worked, the math worked beautifully. It showed the loss of adaptation to the new environment over many generations. Like in the model, it basically says you've got to go thousands and thousands of generations before you adapt to a new environment at later ages. At early ages, you can adapt to a new environment quite fast, but not at later ages. So I went, oh my God, and I did uh, three things. The first one was I persuaded Grant Rutledge and other graduate students to do some experiments on this to check the math. The second thing I did was I talked to my um, closest aging buddies, both literally and figuratively, that is to say, also in their 50s and 60s, uh, uh, but also interested in the science of aging. So they were aging themselves and they were interested in the science of aging. And I said, here's my latest idea. What do you think? And every one of my friends over 40 that I convinced of the science, they changed their diets and they went through exactly the same improvement in their general health that I had gone through. It just worked over and over and over again. Um, and the third thing I did was I created the 55 Theses at the instigation of one of my friends who was aging and interested in aging, Rob Patterson. And so he built this website for me, which you can find at numerals 55thees.org. And uh, he makes a little bit of money from ads there. I, I don't make anything from the website. And there I wrote, 55 sentences that outline my understanding of aging theory, including the diet stuff. I then wrote about 60 pages of material that's also on the website, so it can be read. And we did about 60 podcasts, like this one, where Rob Patterson took me through, step by step, my reasoning that led me to my final conclusion about diet, aging, and lifestyle. What's interesting to me that as a mathematician, I would have expected you to use the math to arrive to the conclusion, but you kind of fell into it by accident and then used the math to prove its efficacy. Thank you for sharing. I'll link to the 55 Thesis website on the show notes for this episode. Now, going back to the experiment that Grant did that you convinced him to do in the fruit flies, and if we mimic the diet, so if after, let's say, after a certain age, you go back to the old diet, which would be the Paleolithic diet or the Paleo diet, how much improvement in either a lifespan or health span did these flies achieve? So you don't get any major health benefit as a human on going paleo under the age of 30, so far as I can tell. Um, that's what the math suggests. That's what our experiments basically suggest. It's only once you get to later ages. And in fact, in humans, it's really like typical. You hit about 40. And in people from the Middle East, it might be 45 or 50. 
in people from Scotland, it might be 30 or 35, but it's, it's the same zone, middle age. And then you start to get uh, loss of muscle mass, uh, midriff bulge, mental fog, less stamina. You, you, know, you can't stay up till three in the morning and then wake up at six in the morning, go to work the way a 23 year old can. All of those things disappear, okay? Uh, but not if you switch to a paleo diet. If you switch to a paleo diet in your 40s, the midriff bulge will go away. You'll re return to younger stamina and you, you won't get any mental fog. Now, if you wait until your 50s, especially in, in my case, um, I was in my mid 50s, the health impact is far greater. So the transition which I underwent from being um, uh, about 53 until about 56 was really obvious. Within about nine months, my friends were saying, what did you do? Why do you look different? Um, you know, so my, my waist shrank and my, you know, pectoral muscles expanded a little bit. I'm, I'm no athlete, don't, don't not that exciting to look at me on this diet. And uh, my, my ability to concentrate uh, mentally, cognitively, was enormously improved. And, you know, as an academic, you know, we live off of our brains, right? So that's, some, that's probably the number one thing I appreciated. Um, you know, my wife probably appreciated different things about the transition. Sure. Now, interestingly, other friends and colleagues of mine in their 50s have gone from like really bad health, just like in some cases appalling health, to quite good health. And a characteristic reaction of my, you know, very, mostly these people are professors, but not only, um, is, wow, this is so amazing, I can't give it up. It's like if they give me six months to a year and they're over 50, um, my colleagues basically go, this is the most incredible thing that's ever happened to me. Fascinating. So you talk about different populations having a different age at which they should switch over to the diet. There's obviously, obviously genetic <coughs> variations even within the populations. Is there a way for folks to know that even though I might be Middle Eastern or Indian or Western mm -hmm. European, I am predisposed because of my genetics to get or I should get on the paleo diet sooner than, generally speaking, the population as a whole should? Okay, that, that, that's a fantastic question. I have spent years thinking about that question. Uh, unfortunately, the thing about human populations is that we're very genetically variable. We have lots of genetic variation. This is one of the most important discoveries of genomics in the last, over the last, uh, 20 years we've been looking at human genomes. People had thought our genomes would be very simple and easy to understand. They aren't. And that's because there's so much variation from genome to genome. Not at one or two sites, not at dozens of sites, not at hundreds of sites, but thousands to tens of thousands of sites. And a lot of that variation is medically important. So, each human being who's not a twin or a triplet, identical twin or identical triplet, is like a different Rembrandt painting, okay? You know, if you're European, you're all Rembrandts, but you're all different paintings, you're all unique. Um, so right now, no one can tell you, aha, I read your genome and you have to make the dietary transition at 38 or 51. And roughly speaking, you can go around the continents of the world, and on a continental scale, you can use crude rules of thumb. So the uh, indigenous populations of the Americas, from what is now the United States South, um, a lot of those populations have had corn-based agriculture for uh, a few thousand years. Uh, an order of magnitude less than Eurasian populations. So they're well adapted to those diets, you know, into their 20s.
but probably by the time they hit 30, they've got to stop even the corn-based diet that they're pretty well adapted to when they're 15. So they have an earlier transition. Um, likewise, in Africa, there are some African agricultural populations. So for example, the area that now corresponds to Nigeria and the surrounding countries had, I believe it was millet-based uh, agriculture, uh, but not of as long standing as Eurasia. So again, they're probably looking at around a 30-ish age of transition. Um, the, the most long standing agricultural adaptations are characteristic of the populations of uh, Asia, from the Middle East and uh, Northeastern uh, Asia. So, in other words, Middle Eastern countries versus Northern China. And the primary crops are, are grains, things like wheat, barley, uh, rye. Interestingly, in Southeast Asia, the primary uh, crop was rice, and those people often show loss of adaptation to uh, grain-based foods like wheat. Um, also, of course, East Asians are not adapted to dairy products, and that there's a lot, actually a lot of good research on that. Um, so, in fact, the history of adaptation to grass species versus milk is not the same. So, of course, the people who are best adapted to dairy products are the populations of South Asia, the Middle East, and Europe. And other than that massive band of humanity, you know, now that's on the order of 2 billion people, the rest of the world's population is not particularly adapted to milk-derived foods after the age of five or six. Now, I want to ask you, and this is a question I ask every guest, what are your top three anti-aging hacks or tips? And I think one of them would be switch to the paleo diet at 30, 40, 45, based on your, where you're from. What would the other two be, Michael? Uh, number two, I would say, is activity patterns. Uh, I don't think you need to be a marathon runner. In fact, the data are that... Uh, Literally, hunter-gatherers who live and feed their families by whether or not they kill a giraffe on a given week, um, they are actually, on average, no more active than we are in our relatively sedentary existence. And I think there are two good reasons for this, one of which, which is not generally appreciated by National Geographic filmmakers, is after going on a long and grueling hunt for a day, they'll then take a one, two, or three days off and lie around and do almost nothing so their body can recover, okay? The second point is the number one most metabolically expensive structure in your body is your brain. Even though it only weighs like between three and four pounds, it can consume anywhere from 20 to 50% of all the calories in your metabolic activity. Our brain is hugely metabolically expensive to build and to maintain and to use, all right? And it sucks up vast amounts of calories. So keeping your brain active literally is keeping your metabolism active. Nonetheless, we are nonetheless adapted to, when we're young, agricultural levels of activity, which means no cars, right? You walk everywhere, you at worst go there on horseback, or pre-agricultural levels of activity, which means not even any horses, you walk everywhere you go, or you walk, run, walk, run, walk, run, rest, walk, run. Um, so uh, I walk to work. Um, and uh, I, actually, this has been a lifelong pattern with me. I, I've avoided cars, you know, from the age of 16. Uh, when I went out to how far is your work from home? Uh, about a month. So, uh, but this is a lifelong pattern. I have lived anywhere from half a mile to three miles away from my place of work, and I've always commuted on foot. And the third thing, which I think is the least important, but still nice, is, you know, you have to realize we are a semi-tribal animal. We're not tribal as baboons, 
but we're still moderately tribal and people like having groups of at least moderately friendly allies whom they see in real life on a daily basis. So the um, 21st century schizoid man lifestyle, and, and that's a, a prog illusion, I'm a prog fan. Um, that's the first King Crimson album, first song. Uh, where you spend most of your time in your basement communicating only through computer screens or cell phones via social media, podcasting, uh, with remote access, that is an emotionally aberrant lifestyle which makes people lonely. I agree, which is why I'm going to come do coffee or do lunch with you shortly. That would be great. That would be great. Okay. Michael, thank you so much. This has been a really fascinating talk, and I've learned so much personally. Where can our listeners find you online? Uh, so I have the 55 Theses, uh, which is, in a sense, inert in that I don't repeatedly post it on it. In addition, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. Um, on LinkedIn, I'd say the majority of my posts are relevant to health and aging. So I'll include some of those links in the show notes to this episode so people can can follow your work and get a hold of you should they. Oh, I, I, you can also find me at the University of California. I have a faculty profile page at the University of California, Irvine which has my email information, my office phone number, um, all that good stuff. I'm, I'm easy to find. Mm -hmm. I did Michael Rose aging and that found you pretty quickly because I was stumbling through Google for a while as well. Yeah, Michael Rose aging is another good way to do it. Michael, thank you for being on the show and I hope to talk to you very soon. You can find all the information we discussed in this episode and links to studies in the show notes at antiagingHacks.net. To make sure you get notified of new episodes, please subscribe to the podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at anti-aginghacks and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash anti-aginghacks. And now for the disclaimers. This podcast is for general information purposes only and does not constitute medical advice. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. Please seek the advice of your health professional for any health or medical conditions.